Well, it is officially two o'clock, so I think we should make a start. Again, thank you so much for coming and joining us. If you've literally only just um, come in, then let me just say to you, we're open to chat, we're open to questions, and there's a box down the bottom that you can put those in. But I'm Paula Pridham, I'm from Care for the Family, and at Care for the Family, we've been working with families and we've been helping churches, local authorities, statutory agencies and community groups work with families too for over 30 years. And it is just a, it's just wonderful that we're involved with this webinar this afternoon. And we're, it's great that we're working with Family Hubs Network on this. And it's great that so many of you have decided to come along this afternoon to join in. And I do hope you're going to find it very helpful. That you'll be enthused. You'll find out things perhaps you didn't know. And if you did know things, perhaps you'll find out how you can expand what you do already know um, in the future with the work that you're doing in your own churches. We've got wonderful guests here this afternoon with us, and we're actually going to start off today. We're hosting at Care for the Family, this webinar, and we're delighted to. And so I'm going to um, hand over in a moment to Robin. I'm just going to remind him, as I will let you know, I'm not going to be rude, but he will get a one minute warning um, to tell him he needs to stop. So if you hear me say that, I'm not being rude, everybody's going to get the one minute warning. Um, but Robin is the Chief Executive of Care for the Family. And so welcome, Robin. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Paula. Well, I am both pleased and honoured uh, to welcome you as you seek to discover more about Family Hub. So thank you for joining this webinar. I guess as we emerge from this pandemic, the isolation that will be felt in families and felt by couples and the need for support has has probably never been more pressing. I know for me personally, literally a few days ago, a trained parenting facilitator currently running one of our courses in their community told me of a parent on that course. And this parent had shared and uh, literally shared with tears in their eyes, the difference that the course content was making to their family. But most of all, and this is what struck me, most of all, this parent just shared about how through that course content and through that course, they no longer felt alone. And research has shown time and time again that the best way to strengthen and improve outcomes for family relationships is by um, early intervention, by support and by education as early as possible in the life of that family or that relationship. And in other words, that means, as we say in Care for the Family, it, mean, it means to build a fence at the top of the cliff rather than just resourcing more and more ambulances at the bottom. There's no doubt, of course, those ambulances are important and we need them, but it's just that fence also that is so important. And that's the evidence that says that's why early intervention or education and support for families makes such a difference. But it's also our experience at Care for the Family. And uh, over the summer, I received a, a letter from a local church leader. And, and this letter just wrote with clarity about the difference that both parenting and relationship resources were making in the lives of those within that community surrounding that church. But also the church leader commented that the engagement was a, with that community was a source of encouragement to the whole church as well. And so it's been our privilege for the past um, three decades to train, resource and support such Christians and churches to make a real lasting difference in the lives of all kinds of families and within all kinds of communities. And today, I hope that you will grasp a little bit of a vision for that. You will hear not just that the local authority and the public sector are open to work with churches and Christian organizations, but that they are really keen to work with us. And so I hope you go away from this encouraged and informed. But most of all, I hope, and indeed I pray that you might catch a glimpse of the incredible opportunities and open doors that are readily available for this idea of um, family hubs, this idea of working with others, especially working with your local community. That's been our experience at Care for the Family. That's been the experience of the people that you're gonna hear from today. And I genuinely hope you're able to catch that glimpse. These are the kind of opportunities and open doors that would enable us as churches and Christians and Christian organizations to not only be a force for the gospel where we live, but also a force for good. And I hope that you will discover that is what is before us. So enjoy your time on this webinar. Thank you for being with us. 
And thank you, Paula, for allowing me to make that welcome. Thank you, Robin. And Robin, you didn't even need your one minute reminder. So thank you very much for that. So um, as we say, Kev, the family are hosting, but this webinar is actually the webinar of the Family Hubs Network. And so I'm delighted now to introduce you to Catherine Barker, who's head of development at Family Hubs Network. And she is going to unpack all about family hubs, how they've come about, and also what that means for the church. Catherine, lovely to see you. Thank you, Paula, and thank you, Robin. We are so grateful to Care for the Family for hosting today's webinar and giving us this great opportunity to talk to so many of you about family hubs. So first off, I'll give you a few words about the Family Hubs Network, because you probably haven't heard of us, but you may well have heard of Samantha Callan. She is, as well as co-founder of the Family Hubs Network, she's also a trustee of Care for the Family, and she's parliamentary advisor to Lord Farmer. Together, Samantha and Lord Farmer have worked tirelessly to develop policy at national and local level to ensure families, and particularly vulnerable and disadvantaged families, have better lives. To do this, families need the right help at the right time to get through challenges and have better outcomes and a better future. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the history here. Family hubs are at the heart of this mission because they bring together people, places and services in a community to work together to help families in need. Samantha and Lord Farmer founded the Family Hubs Network to campaign for this approach to become government policy so that every community has a family hub. So to cut a long, long political story very short, at the end of 2020, while interestingly we were still in the depths of the pandemic, the Department of Education announced that Family Hubs policy would be rolled out across England. Next slide, please. It's interesting because the pandemic actually played an unexpected part. I expect everyone on this webinar is aware that many churches stepped up during this challenging time. They reached out, cared, helped, they made a difference. And churches have demonstrated in the last 18 months beyond any shred of doubt that their role in the community is needed and that they can make a massive difference. At the same time, those working in local authorities were under a lot of pressure. Overnight, the services they knew many families relied on shut down. They couldn't reach vulnerable families. They felt completely helpless. But like so many churches, many local authorities began to think creatively. They reached out in new ways and forged new relationships to ensure that vulnerable families got what they needed. As one local authority employee put it, we tore up the rule book. Why would we go back? So in that sense, the pandemic was liberating and we have the opportunity now to build on those new partnerships, that new way of working. Perhaps you're keen to build on what your church has achieved, or perhaps you're feeling exhausted. Perhaps you're here because you feel you should be rather than you really want to be. If that's the case, I really hope we can inspire you today. So what does that experience in the pandemic have to do with family hubs? Family hubs at their heart are about partnership, about working together to achieve shared goals. So right now there are 152 local authority areas in England where staff are either running family hubs already or developing them. It's a new beginning for how we look after families in our communities and churches have a really crucial role to play. Next slide please. Family hubs, in a nutshell, they are networks of people and places within a community working together to reach and support families who need help. Families can access help at family hubs, which can come in all shapes and sizes. As you can see on this chart, they can include public buildings such as converted children's centres, buildings within school grounds or libraries, and buildings run by the voluntary sector, such as churches, mosques and community halls. What they have in common is easy access, a warm welcome from staff who know not only about what's available in the hub, but have an extensive knowledge of the other people and places in that network in the community. Within the network are other places which are not delivering the same high level of access, staffing and detailed knowledge, but are equally important because of what they offer to families in terms of activities, relationship and support, and therefore playing an absolutely essential part of the network. The connectedness is key 
and ensuring that churches are part of these networks is one of the main reasons we're here today. Slide four. Connectedness is just the start though. Working to a family hub model is about applying nine principles, which I think, to be honest, will make a lot of common sense to churches. The first three are implicit in what I've said already. One, access. Two, early help. Three, for all families. When we say early help, what we mean is helping families when problems emerge to solve them or at least stopping things getting worse. It's about prevention, as Robin was saying earlier. All of us who are passionate about helping children have the best life chances know that early help can make a huge difference. And all nine principles contribute to ensuring that families get the right help in the right way at the right time. For many vulnerable families, raising children is challenging from the very get go. So early year support from conception up to five is an absolute must. But every parent needs to be able to access help and support. This spans from the essential health services like antenatal care and baby checks through to parenting support, so activities for babies and preschoolers, parenting programmes, childcare, to addressing families' wilder, wide, wider needs, including employment, training and welfare support. Which brings me to the next principle, a relational culture. And this one is so big as to why the churches need to be involved, because churches get this. When families are distressed, they need to be able to access help really easily and comfortably. Family hubs are about a relational culture where the people in the hub are focused on being welcoming, ready to engage and not being done with that person until they're sure they're being safely supported. Often that's about being very aware that the presenting problem may not be the core problem. It may be that mum turns up and says, I'm really struggling with my eight year old. And one might think, right, great, uh, we'll get them on a parenting course. But it's not that. It's about talking a bit more and finding out that mum's recently separated from her partner or lost her job or is experiencing depression. By taking this more relational approach, families can get the right help and be helped to access it with warm referrals. By that I mean such as making a phone call on someone's behalf or actually going with them to the place where they can get the help they need, not just signposting. You'll notice I mentioned a relationship crisis in that scenario. Apart from early year support, relationship support is the only service we specify in the principles of family hubs because it's so very important. Often relationship conflict or unhappiness is central to a family's problems and yet those around the family can be reluctant to raise the subject and suggest couple relationship support. And yet if we don't help a couple to improve their relationship or if separated co-parent better, then the negative impact upon children will continue and other problems are more likely to arise to normalise and champion couple relationship support, those working with families need to be proactive and talk about it with empathy and confidence. A whole family approach is the next principle and it makes sense following on from what I've said. Struggling families often face multiple challenges and we need to support the whole family in a holistic way rather than address a list of problems intervention by intervention. Working together in an integrated way is the glue which ensures that organisations work well together to ensure that all families get a seamless, fully empathetic and non-stigmatising experience. This means sharing information and shared goals. While local authorities can internally work more efficiently to this end, their and our ambitions to help families can only really be fulfilled if the voluntary sector and community is included. So looking across those principles, we can see exactly why churches have such a strong role to play. Reaching and supporting families is, for many, core to their mission. They're welcoming, relational, non-stigmatising, they cherish relationship, and they seek to be at the heart of their community. Let's quickly go to slide five, just to show that when we talk about what goes on within a family help network, it's all sorts of things, from specialist interventions to um, more everyday services, which are just as important in building relationships with families to give them that support. And I, I hope that when you think about the kind of things that I've got pictured here, there's something there that your church is probably doing already. There are probably some more um, um, specialist interventions, more demanding uh, ministries that you might be thinking about doing. But the point is every church has a role to play. So next slide, what next? Family hub networks of support are being developed everywhere. And we're really serious about reaching vulnerable families, building relationships with them, making them stronger and helping them have the best life, life chances. Then churches need to be involved from the get go. This afternoon, you're going to be hearing from those who have stepped up in their engagement with their local authorities, develop family hubs, 
and had a great impact on families. They are truly inspiring and I think they will do a good job of bringing family hubs to life. And can I remind you, please put your questions for the panel in the chat so that we can either answer them later or after this event, as we want to make sure that everyone gets as much from this as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, very much. Thank you. As Catherine mentioned, some churches have already been on this journey for a little while, and you're going to be hearing from them this afternoon. And the first church you are going to hear from is Yeovil Community Church and from Rachel Dyer who is the community strategic lead there and they've been running Yeovil for Family with Somerset Council for a number of years now so welcome Rachel lovely to see you with us today over to you to talk to us about what have churches got to offer. Thank you very much that's really really kind a uh, welcome from you and uh, great to be here with you all today. Um, <clears throat> As, uh, as Paula said, uh, my name is Rachel and I'm the Community Strategic Lead at Yeovil Community Church and also the founder of Yeovil for Family, uh, which we run in our church. And our church um, is a church that's over 100 years old. We're an independent church with brethren roots and an adult congregation of around about 350 to 450 um, adults. We're based at uh, The Gateway, which is a community and family hub style space. Um, and we're actually, as you can see from the photograph, we're, we're, we don't look like a traditional church building. We're actually built in a converted car garage and showroom. And we run one of the oldest food banks in the country. Uh, we have a job club. We have parent and toddler groups that run on multiple days of the week, youth groups, children's groups, a drop in for the street community and a coffee shop that runs five days a week, just to name just some of the things that happen out of our building. Our building is run with the aim of loving and serving our community and that we say that Sunday is our quietest day of the week. And as I said, we also run something called a, a family support programme called Yeovil for Family, and that supports people with multiple and complex needs across South Somerset. That support happens in the family home, as well as through access to some of those activities that we run at the Gateway. And we've more recently started also running some peer support groups um, as part of that work, which has been really interesting for us. Now, our, our family support programme, uh, Yeovil Family, was set up in 2011, and at the time was wholly led by volunteers, led and run by volunteers. Well-trained quality people, such as former head teachers, pastoral workers, family support workers, but all volunteers. And just over a year later, we were then delivering the Troubled Families Programme across South Somerset under a contract with South Somerset District Council. So as you can imagine, a lot happened in that year. Um, we've had service level agreements with our council ever since and now support about 200 families at a time with year long, often intensive support. We work alongside schools, social workers, police, health visitors, GPs, mental health teams and so on as part of that support. And when we started Yeovil for Family, we wanted to start small and let it grow organically. We didn't want to set up a separate charity to make it happen. I particularly wanted it to sit under our church trust both from a governance point of view and also for spiritual covering. And this is still the case. Yeovil Community Church is now a CIO, uh, but all of our service level agreements are between the church and the council or church and housing association and so on. So my encouragement to you is it is possible. Um, also, it's not simply the case that we're on this board or that forum in our community, which we are on lots of boards and forums, but it's more than that. And as Catherine said, it's about relationships. It's about partnerships. So, for instance, I'm on the board of something called the Somerset Big Tent, which is an alliance of voluntary sector organisations working in conjunction with Somerset Clinical Commissioning Group, who work together to improve the mental health and emotional well-being of young people in Somerset. As a result of this, I got to know the clinical director of our local primary care network. In turn, this led to more community working together, which led to then our local primary care network approaching us to be the vaccine center for COVID vaccines. And we've been vaccinating people almost every day since the 18th of December, 2020. Now, I don't know the first thing about health. That's not my background, but I do know about people. I know about caring for a hurting community. I know about blessing others with what we've been blessed with. I know about generosity and I know about hope. And we had a large space that we weren't using for church at the time because church had gone online. <clears throat> so um, I think 
what that helped us to do was to, to sort of open up the doors. What that then led to was um, us hosting a, a drop-in vaccine space so that our street community and sex workers could also get the COVID vaccine. This then led to a weekly drop-in for our street community and for those that were at homes where they can access breakfast, play musical instruments or play board games, explore creativity or just sit with a cup of tea. At the same time, they can also see a GP or an occupational therapist or a counsellor. All because we said yes to our space being used for vaccines. So my question to you is, what do you have in your hands? As churches, sometimes we can have many barriers, barriers that we might not always realise that we have. For some churches, the desire to get bums on seats can be a big driver to any social action work or our desire to reach the community. And this can make our public sector colleagues nervous. They might feel that we would take advantage of people's vulnerabilities. And whilst there were some probing questions and at, host at times hostile conversations in steering group meetings with council staff teams, this ultimately wasn't so much of a barrier for us. Our barriers were more along the lines of, will we lose control if we go into a partnership? Will we lose our identity? Will we still be able to pray about which mentors we match with which families? Will it simply be too much work? Will we end up being dictated to by someone else's reporting or data requirements? These are all difficult barriers to get across, and I can't say that they've all been easy to overcome. But for me, whilst the learning curve has sometimes felt like trying to climb Mount Everest without an oxygen tank, whilst wearing flip-flops and a sombrero, it has been hard, and sometimes it seemed impossible. But I know that we are called to love and serve our community. Now, in our family support programme, our vision statement is that by God's spirit and working in partnership, we want to see the tide of family breakdown turned wherever we serve. And I'll never forget a moment after we'd successfully bid for that troubled families contract. And I was a meeting with, with some council um, members of staff to work out an implementation plan. And I felt that there were so many things that we needed to consider from the risk register to a better computer system than the one that we had, staff recruitment timelines, to name just a few things. And I sat in our coffee shop with uh, one of the council managers thinking, oh, this is all too much. Like, what have we agreed to? And I really felt God say to me really clearly in sort of neon lights. He showed me the word in my mind, the word partnership, neon lights. And I felt God say to me, Rachel, if this isn't partnership, then what is? And that really helped me. It helped us to see the bigger picture of what we were being called into. And in that same meeting, someone from the council said, look, we know that you pray about which mentors you're going to match with which families. So please, can you make sure that you don't write that in your project plan? But keep doing the praying thing, because we know that that's a good thing, but just don't write it down. And, and I think sometimes we just need to listen to each other and be willing to try to understand each other better. Because what they were effectively saying was that there are things that, that make things tricky for a council, but that they understand the importance and the value of them. I could have dug my heels in, but what would that have achieved? We absolutely respect that we are meeting people at often their most vulnerable point in their life. So we don't impress our faith on them, but we are ready to give an explanation for why we give up our time to volunteer or why we started the program in the first place. But only if a family asks, only if they invite the conversation. We pray for them, but not in their front room. We state that we're a Christian organization, but we work with all faiths and none. As Christians, we're called to love, not to judge. Our church mission is to live out faith, hope, and love in our community. Not so that we get bums on seats, but so that lives are transformed. Whether or not someone makes a commitment of faith isn't a reason for us to support someone. We believe that we're called to feed the hungry, to care for orphans and widows in their distress, to love outrageously. So what do you have in your hands? When I think about how we started, I have to acknowledge that our church has a history of supporting the community, of reaching out to people in difficult circumstances. This didn't happen overnight in 2011. There'd been a food bank in our church for the past 30 years. People have fostered children, volunteered at the night shelter, run fitness groups and choirs, all for our community over many, many years, long before the church even bought the Gateway Building. So my invitation to you is to start somewhere to look at what you have in your hands, your expertise, your resources, 
Start with a kettle and a toaster if you have to. One a minute. Tea. And a slice of toast can go a long way to making someone feel safe, cared for and noticed. Don't focus on all that you don't have. Look at what you do have. So as I sum up here, um, <clears throat> I think there are three things that I would say that we've learned and that are important. The first thing, relationships, play the long game, invest time in them. Secondly, ask of your council or public sector leaders, what keeps you awake at night? And ask of yourselves, what can we do to help? How can we be part of the solution? And the third thing, understand the unique thing that you bring to your community that your council can't. Remember, none of us have all the answers, but what do you have in your hands? Thank you. Rachel, thank you so much. That is, inspi that is inspiring. Um, and also it could be maybe overwhelming, you're doing so much there, but lovely to hear that you started small. And I think that's a, a good thing for some of us, perhaps we're just thinking, crikey, there's so much there that you can start small, but obviously you've got a great band of people there working together. You've been doing some great work and relationships. So all power to you in all that you're doing. Thank you for that. So next we have an interview with Jenny Peters and Catherine's interviewing Jenny. Jenny is the director of Connected Lives, which is a charity, which we'll say more about um, in the interview. And they work alongside Westminster City Council and working in family hubs. So over to you, Catherine and Jenny. Jenny, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, I wonder if you could start off telling me a little bit about what you do, your role and um, who you work for. Absolutely, it's lovely to be with you. Um, so I have two kind of roles. I'm on the leadership team of a church in Westminster in um, Marlborough, and I'm also, um, the main thing that I do is I'm the director of a charity called Connected Lives. And we, we were set up really out of a family support project that came out of the church as a charity in our own right. And we sort of exist to offer early help for parents and partners from an attachment and a sort of trauma informed um, perspective. We have two hubs at the moment, one in North West London, one in Cambridgeshire, and we're like looking for committed partners to sort of build a network really um, and we do all kinds of things we do all the general things that lots and lots of people will know about like drop-ins and visiting programs and all those kind of things but the main thing that we do in particular are these targeted interventions which are called circle of security parenting and hold me tight groups for couples and they really give um, parents and partners the sort of space to take a step back and think about um their emotional needs of their kids and the emotional needs of their partner and what stops us from responding to some of those legitimate needs and when we when we get really stuck and we're hitting up against something we don't really understand it that we want to give all people kind of no matter their background and no matter their history the sort of opportunity to um reflect and make changes if they need to and we do that in conjunction with Westminster so we work really closely with the perinatal mental health team and the west the north Westminster family hub so I'm on the um integrated leadership team of the family hub so we meet every other week and to just try and work in a really joined up manner I suppose. Well, that sounds like really really valuable work. Uh, how did you get involved with working with Westminster Council? Well we when we first started doing circle of security parenting I felt like gosh this is such a good program. A it was like popular with parents and it was also not just helping the worried well, because often parenting programs are full of people who are doing a brilliant job, you know, and they like thinking about it, but the people who might be struggling um, actually don't necessarily come along to groups. But we were finding that there were the people who probably had the most significant struggle were actually getting the most help out of it. So I kind of thought, well, this might be useful for Westminster. So I approached them and said, um, hi, you know, and we were working directly out of the church at that time. I said, hi, this is who we are. And this is Circle of Security Parenting. And it's an evidence-based program. And you can find, you know, you can find all the evidence online, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we wondered if you'd be interested in sort of partnering with us. And I had a really lovely meeting 
thing and a very polite thank you but sort of no thank you response you know we have our own parenting programs thanks um sounds sounds great but it's not something that we're particularly interested in pursuing because we're really busy doing you know all the stuff that we're doing and i do think for churches we need to appreciate that local authorities are you know they have a huge responsibility in terms of the families they're working with their vulnerable families they need to trust us and it's not a given that you know here you are you're from a local church okay i was i was a child protection social worker but you know it's kind of like well we don't really know you so they there is a level of trust that we sort of have to build up so we sort of i think i have a gift of just politely not going away it's one of my <laughs> gifts in life and um so i would just every now and again i'd send them a little email going oh just to let you know you know we've done x number of groups and work with x number of parents um, and then in 2014, I happened to be standing next to sort of the head of parenting procurement, or I don't exactly know his title. Um, and we were at a, the launch of a report, which was called Conception to Age Two, the first 2001 days, that was really looking at the early, how fundamentally important the early years were, and how fundamentally important attachment was, and how we needed to sort of develop preventative programs that help people and help parents really when their their children were really little at the time all their brains were forming etc and so um circle of security was listed as an intervention that um that they had evidence behind it to show that it basically helped promote secure attachment which is the thing everyone wants and so um the very nice man um he he, he looked at me and he said oh circle of security parenting you know is that what you do I said, well, it is actually. And he said, oh, well, I don't think we do do anything like that. And I, was, I said, oh, well, you know, maybe. And he said, well, do you think we could partner with you? I said, I think that's a really good idea. So um, sort of from that point onwards, we began to work, you know, we just, you know, a little bit of working together. Um, and Jane Birkin in particular was incredibly helpful. Um, and it's really sort of strengthened and developed, particularly with the family hubs um, bit coming online, because I think that sort of, almost inviting partnership so as i said now i'm on the um, integrated leadership team we do we deliver circular security groups they westminster refer people to us they also advertise them i they've trained probably about another 40 practitioners in the approach from westminster and so they deliver out of their three hubs and i sort of try and support that as, as and where i can so it's kind of it feels like it's really grown and developed as a partnership mm. what a great story of how that came about <laughs> Um, so what's it like working with Westminster Council now? I would say it's, um, it feels like it's, it's, you know, hopefully, I mean, it, it'd be good to hear from them too, but it, it feels quite mutually beneficial in a way. It's a, it's a good partnership. We're not trying to be the council. We're trying to do the bit that we're trying to do. We couldn't work with the level of vulnerability that a lot of um, our, you know, our colleagues work with in Westminster. So, you know, they're working on their bit. We're trying to support support our bit and we're trying to mutually we've got the same goals and I think quite often as churches we might be a bit fearful of local authorities and think oh gosh you know what are they like what do they want but actually they want to support families and they want to support family life and they want to try and help well that's not a million miles away from what we're trying to do if we're really passionate about helping in our community as churches so um sort of accept that you know we're mutually supportive I would say and it gives us access to families that we might not otherwise um, have access to it gives us sort of advertising it gives us i guess a degree of credibility um for people who would no way would they come into a church but you know if it's if it's if it, westminster recognize it then it, you know it's okay it's kind of really pushed us as well i think to evidence what we do so you know i think quite often we think oh, i know it's helpful you know oh why do we have to do all these forms and why do we have to do all this analysis and evaluation and i don't like forms i really don't um but actually it's kind of made us do it and now we have this sort of body of evidence in terms of pre and post measures that we use etc cetera, etc cetera. so that really helps us too um and for westminster i think i'd like to think they get quite a high quality service at a relatively low cost well very low cost in terms of you know what we're delivering and I think the final thing, which is always good for churches to remember in particular, and probably local authorities, is that churches are consistently there. So we've, as I said, we're setting up a hub in Cambridgeshire, and I wasn't quite sure how much to mention the church connection, just because you're never quite sure of the territory um, and the level of, you know, whether, whether people are going to think that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so I sort of 
sort of punted it a little bit and they said oh we love working with churches because they're consistently there and I thought that's really interesting that's you know it's not necessarily a sort of a given so I think we have all those things that um you know that we can hopefully we can benefit one another mm. that is so interesting thank you so much for those insights any last tips that you'd like to share with everyone I think the challenges we are facing now, I mean, I like every, every other organisation working with families, working with families in the pandemic was a whole other level of stress and distress and um, poor mental health and anxiety. And, you know, and that was, and you could just see the need. We need, it really was a question of we need everyone. So if you're, if you're um, in a church and you feel like, you know, I want to do something, I would say anything is good. You know, we need to, be brave we need to partner and we need to try and kind of do what we can do your research find out what your aims of your local authority are what in terms of families what are they going for how could you help them meet any of it you know because then they will really love you because you're not posing an issue for them you're helping them solve the thing that they have set themselves to do and I think probably don't despise that even the sort of things that we feel like well everyone does that so I was I was at a um infant mental health conference and there was lots of brilliant keynote speakers but they were also really good because they got service users to come along and talk about their experience their lived experience so they had a mum who had quite severe postnatal depression and she um and she was basically talking about a time she was she she was feeling so awful she left her house and she gets she gets to a junction and she can either go left and she will go to the river and she will commit suicide or she will go right and she will go to the church toddler group always get a bit emotional in this story um and she said the reason i'm standing here today is because i turned right now i don't know if that church toddler group ever knew actually you know but but they had provided they had provided a space of kindness and it was consistent and she knew it was going to be there and you know those things actually make such a big difference to people's lives i just think you know get involved do it up to your skill set but get involved um and i think there's a kind of open door it feels like with the family hub hubs there's a more of an open door so i just encourage people to walk through it brilliant thank you so much jenny such a privilege to talk to you today thank Great. you Lovely. Yes, indeed. Jenny, thank you so much. Um, interesting. We've had the breadth of um, what's going on with Rachel in Yeovil. And then obviously here is a specific project, which again is doing amazing work. And Jenny, I love that highlight that um, Jenny said about the church is the constant that is always there. And, and I like the fact actually as well that Jenny said about politely, the gift of politely not going away. And of course, as churches, that's what we can be, the gift that is politely not going away there as the constant. Also, Jenny did say that she'd be interested to hear what Westminster Council thought of the work that they do, but it just so happens that that may well come true for her any moment now, because Catherine is gonna speak with Steve Bywater. So welcome to Steve. He is the Supporting Families Strategic Manager at Westminster City Council. It's lovely that you're with us, Steve. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. And so we're gonna hear from the other side. What is it like as um, um, somebody from the, statutory sector, the local authority, getting involved with family hubs and churches. Thank you, Paula. Well, Steve, you're in a very powerful position here. You've just heard what Jenny said and uh, you've got the last word. So um, <laughs> let, let's crack on. Um, start off just by telling us a little bit about what you do, what your role is. Just first of all, to say, Jenny, a uh, really valued partner locally. Um, we've been really instrumental in kind of getting getting the sector involved with the family hubs that we've started to develop in Westminster. And um, I might actually mention later on a, a bit of work that I've been doing with her recently, which um, really valued her support with. It's not very interesting, but quite important. Um, my background is I'm um, supporting families manager in Westminster, which is what um, we're now calling the Troubled Families Programme, which was referred to earlier by Rachel. Um, and uh, Westminster got something called earned autonomy through the programme, which meant that we were um, given the privilege, I think, of being able to invest quite a lot of funding in, um, up front into our early help system. And one of the main vehicles we, we used for that was our family hub programme, which we've had um, developing probably since around 2016, but the actual buildings and entities since 2018. Um, so that's broadly where I've come from. Um, 
I should probably say a bit more about that, that investment. So what we spent some of the funding on was um, some training, a workforce development program, which um, was a really helpful thing, I think, for us to kind of get a range of different practitioners, similar sort of skill bases, um, but also to get partners um, involved with what we were doing. Um, we had ready-made partners in a way out there um, that we already had good relationships with, but this was something else to offer to them. Um, and also develop some roles as well. Um, we got a role of a family navigator, which is based in all of our hubs, um, doing initial direct work with families, again, with partners and sort of linking them into that. Brilliant. Tell me a bit more about Besborough Family Hub, because I know that's your first one. And I think because we started with the Yeovil Family Hub, which run by church, it's really helps to everyone if you can tell us a bit what, what, uh, about what a local authority run what it looks like. Okay. Uh, well, Besborough is based in Pimlico, which people might know, right, right next to the tube station. Um, it's an old um, maternity building. It's got the old inscription from about 1930, I think, on the front. But um, it's sort of housed a range of different um, professionals over the years. Um, but with the development of the family hub, we brought the children's centre function, which was previously in a school up a set of stairs down the road um, into the building so that's more accessible we've got health visitor space there we've got a gp surgery the early help service um, the sort of council early help service is based there and also social workers and a range of other professionals that come um, for sessional um, support for families um, including people at shelter to do with housing support um, these employment coaches for parents that want support into employment, uh, CAMs. We also had the birth registration um, function there for a while. I think that's coming back after um, not doing it during um, lockdown periods. Um, so a lot of agencies based in the same place um, and also a lot of activities for families and that's grown up over time. So things like stay and plays, um, various sessions for where families can bring their children in the other thing i should say is it's now a naught to 19 or potentially up to 25 service as opposed to what we were doing purely through children's centers um and uh, another part of that sort of network is um, youth hubs which we've got i think five across the borough um two of them are linked in with besborough their youth clubs probably i don't know probably uh 400 yards on either side of the, the, that building so a place that young people can go into which is young people friendly um but the, the, the aim is that parents can get support through the family hub including for teenagers if that's what they need um it's been a really fluid situation in a good way in that um we've constantly grown the range of agencies that are based or working as part of Besbra over time um a recent addition for example might be the library um service so the library manager takes part in in meetings around the family hub and most importantly um voluntary and community sector organizations who um I think harking back to what people were saying earlier, they it feels like they've always been there and they always will be there. Um, sort of big, um, sort of church or faith-based linked um, organisations such as the Cardinal Hume Centre and St Vincent's Family Project, who provided a range of different support for children and families for a long period of time. The other important thing I should say about the hub is that we have an integrated leadership team, which is um, planning and organizing what goes on there. And that includes pretty much all of the partners that I've just been talking talking about. Um, aiming to work towards a, a kind of shared model, I think, for families. So no matter who you go to, to get support for your family, you're gonna get a broadly similar response. You don't have to keep telling your story. And whoever you, you choose to go to, to, to share your, whatever's going on in your family, they should know what's also available from other agencies across the area. Let's, because of the time we've got, let's, can we spotlight on um, your, your, the way you work with faith organisations? I think that's so interesting about how you make it work in Westminster. Give us the other side of the story from what um, Jenny's been given. Well, it, it does feel like in some respects they're almost a ready-made um, resource that um, is there and has been there for a long time. Um, I, th I think it's fair to say that we had pretty good relationships with them before we started to think about family hubs um, and a feel feeling that they were connecting with people that we weren't. Um, so Cardinal Hume works particularly, I think it started off focusing particularly on um, 
homeless people, um, homeless adults, but it's increasingly thought about families that are in either at risk of homelessness or um, or just in poor quality accommodation and trying to work with them to improve that situation. And that's kind of grown out into a more um, a kind of family support service. Um, and they're based, yeah, probably um, I don't know, a 10 minute walk away from the family hub. And then St Vincent's, um, similarly in a way, that's in the Central Methodist Hall, which is just over the road from Parliament, working with families, providing family support, um, and also sort of therapeutic support for families as well. And I think it was, um, it's, it's probably a mixture of um, existing relationships that we've had with them, but also they aim to do things more together going forward. And the, the real strength of this, I think, is that they are, they are in contact with people that we're not. We want interventions to be as early as possible. We want them to be provided by people that families trust and want to go and talk to. But at the same time, what we, what we were offering, I suppose, was a wider structure for these organisations. What I, my sort of discoveries about them is that they are quite small compared to a big local authority where there's social workers and early health practitioners. They might, there might be three or four people in one of these organisations doing the direct work with, with families. Um, but they, they're very good at making those links. And the other thing that we've been able to offer them is sort of training, which um, sometimes they're highly skilled and highly trained. Sometimes they're people who, who are volunteering and just want to do something for their community. So we've given them access to multi-agency training, access to a network um, in, in the area. Um, and actually, some, in some cases, sort of some opportunities for, for further professional development. Um, and yeah, they're consistently willing to sort of get involved with things i think um which we really really can i just say one of the things one of the things you mentioned the other day was that the fact that uh, the training you involve in, in, it helps the people who are working with families know to how to have the difficult com conversations and how yeah. to um know what to do with the results of that difficult conversation so you keep that family safe and enable them yeah. to access the support that's needed and i I thought that was really encouraging because some churches you sort of you worry about what, where the conversation is going to go and, and how mm. you deal with what you uncover. Um, yeah. And it sounds like you have a good history of that in Westminster. Am I right? Yeah, it feels like that. I think um, with these integrated leadership teams, they set up um, panel systems. So the managers of the two organisations have just spoke to a, a part of that. So if they've got practitioners that are working with a family and they're concerned, they're not really sure where to go with it, they can take it to that panel and get a kind of multi-agency view. And sometimes some will offer to get involved with that case and either sort of lead it or support the person that's already doing that. Mm -hmm. The other area that we've looked at is kind of how people who do work directly with, with other people. Um, One minute. Are, are, they, are, they, are they supervised? Um, and again, opportunities to do that as a group, as part of the family hub for practitioners who otherwise might feel quite isolated. So yeah, some, some good routes for, for people like that who need more support. In the last few seconds that we've got, can you just, I've, to be honest, some people are really positive about working with local authorities, some people are really sceptical. Can you give some tips which covers that breadth of uh, feeling? Yeah, I think I'd probably echo what Jenny was saying. You possibly need to keep chipping away sometimes and find the right person to talk to. But that said, um, I think there are some opportunities at the moment. Um, someone said to look at the kind of their, their aims of the authority, look at their early help strategy, look at early help. Every authority is doing early help in some shape or form. Um, I would say think about the um, think about coronavirus, the, the, the pandemic and what's been done during that period. I think lots of agencies other than local authorities have found lots of people who need support and where do you go next with that? And that all, all local authorities are talking about the recovery and, and how they do that. If they're going to do that well, they need to do it with partners. Um, Steve, we've better stop it there. If you're any, any, sorry, let you complete your sentence. But I, I could talk to you all day, but I, I must <laughs> stick to the time. Um, and also, yeah, the Supporting Families Programme, which is set up where I came from, that, that's got four elements. One of them is communities. So the government department that's leading on that is encouraging local authorities to think about who, who works with families, who has good relationships with them, how can you support them to support them better? So tapping into that might be a way in, in some local authorities to where you haven't met, managed to find an inroad before. Brilliant. Thank you, Steve. Thanks so much. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much, Steve. That is really helpful. And I think particularly that advice about when you're struggling 
to connect with your local authority because certainly at care for the family we, we do hear hear that a lot whether it's because the church themselves don't really know how to go about it or because they are sort of hit maybe some brick walls and, and not sure how they actually sort of get the phone answered or who they should be speaking to so thank you for that so much um now Another church that's been doing this for quite a while is um, Cheriton Baptist Church in Folkestone. And Catherine interviewed their senior minister, Dave Barker, and they started up something called the Hub Supporting Families. And they did that after a community audit. So again, over to Catherine and Dave. Dave, thank you so much for talking to me today. I wondered if you could start just by telling me a bit about yourself. Yeah, I'm Dave Barker. I'm based right near the Channel Tunnel in Folkestone, Kent, married to Karen, and have two amazing girls and five amazing grandkiddies, which is a real privilege. Um, I'm a pastor at Cheriton Baptist Church, and I'm also a paddle sport coach. Um, and I love the world of paddle sport. And one of my key passions is to see community transformation. Fantastic. You, so you've started the hub in, uh, in, in Folkestone. I mean, how does it serve families in your community? Well, how it serves the community is that we first of all listened to what we felt there were gaps in the community. So in fact, as we're doing this interview, we've just had the hub, it's just finished. And um, this morning there was tots and toys uh, for parents to come and bring their children and they wanted something structured and also free play so we were able to create with the parents what that could look like then straight after that we have the hub coffee bar and at the hub coffee bar we have people that are trained to as good listeners people to pray if people would love us to pray into situations for them but also we run parenting courses, well-being courses, and things like that. And every, every sort of like six to eight weeks, term time-ish, we actually have a different menu that we send out to our local schools, our local authority, and our community Facebook pages so that people can come. But all the time we're listening to what are the needs, and we put the best we can various things on to address those needs. Mm. I mean, you mentioned the local authority there. I mean, thinking specifically about them, how do you work with them and, and how does that make your ministry more effective? I think for us, it's to work with the local authority um, out of relationship and a real heart to support. We often go into our council chambers and pray and worship uh, because we really believe that is something we can offer from a spiritual perspective. And then just to make ourselves available to serve our local authority as we expect them to serve us. So we found it, it needed to be a partnership. So it came out of relationship over a period of time and we've listened to what they felt was really needed, like listening hubs, hubs where people can come for signposting. And really we've adopted some of that in our listening to our local authority and began to put those on. And our local authority uh, is really quite pleased to partner with that. And we involve them in as much as we can and let them know all that we're doing and for them to have input. Yeah, that's interesting. But it does sound like a lot of work. I mean, what's been the impact on your church family? I think for us, it, it was one of our key values. We really wanted to, what would help bring community transformation and what part do we play? So everything like the hub, we take the church on a journey. Not everyone's going to be involved, but everyone can pray. And it's like we've had a whole army of people making cakes uh, to bring to the hub. We've got people, I can offer that. I can read stories to kids. I can do songs and, and things like that. So we, what we do, we, we take the church on a journey way before we've set it up so that we've got a groundswell of expectation um, we believe this is part of our vision and a part of our contribution to community transformation. Brilliant. Any tips for churches thinking of following in your footsteps? I think one of the things which we've learned, we, we were great at putting on events and things like that, 
um, and involving others. But we realized that it's far better to listen to the community, have conversation with community, and to really bring our faith into what the community is looking. It's like the tune that the community is whistling to, listen to that and then bring your faith into that. And that's really what we've done with the hub is listened and we want to keep changing it. I think the, the difficulty for us churches, we can get stuck in a rut. Do you know what? We've always done the hub that way. No, we want to keep morphing, if you like. We want to be like that chrysalis that's going to slowly fly into a butterfly and change to be effective. So yeah, I think it's going to keep changing. Dave, thank you so much. Wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. Ex excellent. And um, great ideas there from Dave. I mean, I love the idea of having I mean, this menu that they send out regularly to other organisations and the local authority, but also that key piece of wisdom, I think, about listening to the whistle of the community um, and finding out exactly what is needed and wanted rather than maybe going in with their own agenda. So very wise words there from from Dave and great that he was able to, to do that interview for us. Um, now, the next person we've got speaking is Ian Soares. Ian is Managing Director of Vegans. If you don't know about vegans, they're a charity. They help um, young people with counselling, but they also have, they work on the mental health agenda as well and provide mental health support across the UK. And they also work alongside churches, helping churches work in family hubs. So Ian, over to you. I think you're gonna help us sort of think about what we need to do if we wanna get involved. Yeah, Ian, thanks so much for talking with us today. Um, can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and, and also just go straight into explaining the wonderful family hubs that Vegans runs in preschools? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, my name is Ian Soares, uh, Managing Director of Vegans. We're part of Spurgeons now, we've just been acquired. Um, but vegan, vegan speciality is, is family hubs, and, um, and we deliver that in partnership with schools and churches uh, across the southeast. Um, our main thing that we, terms, we do in terms of services is, we, as you just heard, uh, we counsel children, so children with suicidal ideation, um, and uh, eating disorders, anxiety, depression, those sorts of things. And we counsel about 500 children every week, uh, predominantly in schools and churches. Uh, we also do parenting, and you'll find a common theme with Family Hubs is all about parents. Uh, why? Because if you get to the parents, uh, you know, you can actually uh, resolve a whole load of pain uh, very quickly and often actually very cost effectively. Uh, the third thing we do, we have preschools. I'll come back to those in a moment uh, in obedience to you, Catherine. Uh, and then uh, the final thing is we have a big digital arm, which we might have time to talk about a bit later, where we take a lot of the expertise that we have and then we overlay it over every, uh, all of our services. But in terms of all of those services, we deliver those services, but we do them in partnership with local churches. And the whole aim of that is that we can maybe do some of the heavy lifting, some of the more complex work that churches might find, actually take these big steps into your community. If we can do that, and then we can release churches uh, to do relational work and, and parenting work. So instead of working with substance abuse or those sorts of things, we'll pick up that. Uh, you, you, you do a uh, community space. In terms of the preschools, we have more than one model of family hub. And, and that's part of the joy of this conversation. And also part of the complexity is uh, all of us are always thinking, what is a family hub? And actually, it's a bit of a movable feast. But one of the models we have um, uh, is uh, we have two preschools. Uh, uh, one is based in a church, one based on site in a school. Both have good church um, connections. Uh, the preschool, we, we do this intentionally. It's like a nursery preschool, but uh, still offset regulated and so on. But um, it, it works nine to five and it's turn time only. Um, and, and that means it gravitates to, you know, for preschool centre, we gravitate into areas of high need. And in that context, it means you've got a ready source uh, made of families who are actually uh, on site and, and, and needing support and care which is great, but also on site, uh, you've got a load of experts, you know, trained early years practitioners that you've got, that we double train some in domestic violence, some in parenting, uh, some in, in just working alongside with uh, autistic or, or, or kids with additional needs. So you can get these services bolted on. Um, and then on top of that preschool, uh, we then uh, bolt on parenting, formal parenting, and we do counseling both for kids and for their parents. Uh, we then partner with um, the local churches to do Zoom classes. So you've got a real holistic service there, right in the heart of the community where they where they need it. Brilliant. I mean, you've reflected on 
what churches can think about in terms of their routes forward. Um, you know, we're at the point in the, in the event where we've heard lots of stories of how people are working. What would you say are the, the, the sort of the possible routes? How would you present it? So let me start by saying, I think um, my charity is uh, sensational, but I can tell you this, there's only one bride of Christ and it's the, the Christian church. And actually we, however good our charities are, we can't solve these issues. And actually what I, my hope is, my passion before Christ is not that, uh, you know, we come away with more family hubs, we, that we empower you guys. But in that journey that, you know, I've been taking along with my charity and colleagues and so on about partnering with churches, this is what we've found. Um, and I'm going to, just for today's sake, I'm going to wrap it up in who, why, what, when, where. And the first thing you've got to start off with is why. Why are you doing this? And for me, this is a theological question. Get your theology straight. Because actually, when you do a family hub, it can be really hard, really hard work. Some of the things you will see in here will be heartbreaking. And there are many tears shed in anyone who's working in a family hub on a weekly basis. But you might say, well, my theology is going to be based around, I don't know, um, the Ten Commandments, the Second Commandment, to love your neighbour as yourself. And we partner with a church that wants to give away half of its money. It's nearly there. So whatever it receives in income, it then invests into its local community. Your theology and your why might be something about Revelation 21. We want to see the kingdom of heaven come here on earth. Your theology might be about um, uh, uh, religion, uh, faith without works is dead. And we actually, we really want to show that our faith is alive by doing works. Or it might be something as simple as um, uh, Deborah, uh, which is from Judges, and, and she said, uh, uh, you know, there was village life had ceased until I, Deborah, a woman, a mother, arose, arose in, in Israel. And your theology, that if you hold on to that, that why, why are you doing this? That would get you through some tough times. And then the next thing is uh, vision, um, where you're headed. So if you know why you're doing it, what's happening today, where you're going. And, and actually, a lot of people, again, vision might be something like... Um, we want to be the hands and feet of God. We want, when people see us, they want to know what our God is like. If they, they look at the work we do, and you've heard time and time again from, from incredible practitioners like Rachel and Jenny, and you're going to hear it from um, uh, Avril, it's all relationship. If we demonstrate unconditional love, then your vision might be saying, then they'll understand what our Father in heaven is like. You might be old school, and your vision might be about, well, you want to go back to the Middle Ages, where the church was the centre of community. The church was the centre. If you want to, if you want to get educated, go to the church. If you want to get healed, go to the church. And if you want a good glass of mead, then you go to the church. And today that might be uh, children's counselling and a cappuccino, but you get the idea. You know, this that might be your vision, or it might be uh, just to be the heart of God in your in the heart of your community. So once you've got the, the, the theology right and where you're headed. Um, I love Rachel was talking about what have you got in your hands and that refers to the question that as you all know that God asked Moses because Moses says you can't send me you can't send me and then God says what do you have in your hands and uh, then you just look at this and he says well I've got a staff and this is the staff that parted the seas that turned all that stuff but he started off with well I'm just a shepherd that's all I know and um, I've got uh, because we're part of Spurgeon's I've got a Spurgeon's like book here and uh, Spurgeon says this the quote for the day self is the worst enemy a Christian has. And I assure you, just as Rachel did, that if you begin to love your community, uh, that's a great place to start. Brilliant. I mean, that's, that's really inspiring. What would you say are the sort of the benefits to, to the church of getting involved in this work? As you said, there's a lot, a lot of pain, um, but the, and the aggro and the effort of engaging with the local authority can be really hard work. What are the benefits? Why is it worth it? So I used to work in a corporate environment and I used to ask this question uh, of people I was working with. Why are we here? Why are we here? Because if you can't ask, answer that question, and I think a lot of churches right now existentially are saying, why are we here? And uh, we'll all be familiar with the scripture in Joel 2 where he says, without a vision, the people perish. But actually, I don't know if you've ever thought about unpicking that, but it's about saying, well, actually, if you don't have a vision, you don't actually die. So what is he trying to get at? And, and it, for me, I, I was talking to a senior church leader in the Church of England yesterday. And they were talking about in the particular uh, region of England, actually, the church is in significant decline. And I would point to Joel too. And, uh, and for me, the heart of this for any church is to say, we begin to answer this question. I know why we are here. We are here to demonstrate what God looks like in our community. So actually, you begin to find not just that your church gets galvanized, like really you become alive with it, but the faith in, you know, belief in action, as the Salvation Army would say, begins to, be, begins to you, you know, uh, results with real dividends and actually rather than just being a couple of you know uh, hours on a Sunday morning we're beginning to do so I love Rachel when she says you know Sunday is our quietest day 
that is the church in action. And I think in terms of morale, in terms of vision, in terms of purpose, in terms of meaning, in terms of releasing calling, in terms of raising leadership, this is one of the key things uh, uh, that all of us are facing right now in terms of what's happening in our nation. Great. That's really thought provoking stuff. I'm glad we've got a Q&A panel coming up so that people can uh, ask you some questions about this. So um, brilliant. Thanks so much, though, Ian. And um, yeah, back to Paula. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Ian, indeed. And thank you, Ian, as well, for that sort of theological underpinning to all of this as well. You've been having a lot of conversation about the practical around it, but um, just to hear that, ups, that other reminder about that theological underpinning of why we are doing what we're doing, what our vision is, is, is really helpful and thoughtful for us to get involved with. Um, Ian mentioned Avril, and he was talking about Avril McIntyre, who is our next speaker. Um, Avril is the Director of Community Resources. Now, they work in Barkingham, Dagenham, and Redbridge and Havering. I think it's Havering, not Havering. And Community Resources grew out of Lifeline Church in Dagenham. And I was going to come and talk to us about how, if we want to get involved, how do we get started? Welcome, Avril. Thank you very much. Now, a lot of, and just to be clear that we don't actually work in Havering, we work in Barkingham, Dagenham and Redbridge. Don't want to upset anybody in Havering. Um, a lot of what I was going to talk about today has actually been said, and I'm really pleased about that because it gives me a chance to do a wee bit more of a reflective um, seven minutes to help you just have a think about some of the things that have been said today and what it impact of where it fits for you. So I'm just going to take us through five slides. They have some questions on them. And as I go through them, I just want you to have a bit of paper and a pen handy and start to write down some of the things that have struck you or made you think during the talk. So just a little moment about me. I've got 20 years experience. I know, I don't look a day over 30. Um, with working with local authorities and leading a charity that came out of the church that ended up being a large charity, delivering a lot of government contracts regionally, locally and nationally, but now leading a small grassroots charity that is very much the community arm of Lifeline Church, which is based locally. And I think in that time, the two things we really hold on to is that if we're known for anything, it should be connection. That's connection with our local people, with the community around us, and with the, the different agencies, but also competence. I was talking to somebody on Saturday who was saying, oh, it's so frustrating, you know, you hear about all these children go to school hungry and we want to be part of helping and feed them, but there's so many hoops you've got to jump through. And you can think, well, yes, there are quite a lot of hoops you've got to jump through, but you're really able to jump through those hoops. And if you can't, then we can help you do so. And actually some of that is a competence to say, we are safe, we can be trusted, but we also want to meet the needs we see. So let me just take you through some questions. The first one in the next slide, please. Rachel and Jenny have already talked about it and Ian did as well. What does your church offer already? You know, some people come at it and they kind of do a mapping of needs in the local area. I think that can be a helpful thing, but actually I think what the other speakers have said and certainly our experiences Go with what is your strengths already. What are you good at as a church to one another? And how, as the walls of your church come down, can you serve the community with those same strengths? For us, it was a relational thing. We're a very community-based church. We just kind of connect with our neighbours, with people at the school gates, with people who come into activities we do. And through that, just built a reputation of being a trusted place. And that then led to other people bringing their friends along to things or to connecting, which actually over the years have led to some government contracts as we kind of developed as a charity. It's led to referrals, a constant place of referrals. But often when you follow through with the family, you meet the professionals involved in those lives. And they start to talk about you thinking, oh, they're really quite helpful people. And you build a conversation that way. So what is your church? offer already. The next question I want to ask you is where are you already connected? And people have asked in the chat about how do you get started and Jenny and um, Steve were talking about sometimes you just have to find the right person. But we've always found that 
the first people that's most important to get to know are the people in your community. Because if you go into a local authority and say, we want to do something, but you don't know anybody and you're not really doing very much already, it's a wee bit of a kind of clanging gong, really. But you'll have activities in your church already. So just think about who already connects in and who do they know and who might they know. And it's really interesting. I think the different speakers have said one thing leads to another. Who are your local councillors? Get to know them. Let them know what you're already doing and what you'd like to do. In your in our church, there's like a million teachers and social workers and foster parents. Give the church exposure to what they're doing, some of their challenges, some of their pressures, and you'll find that there's a real understanding of what is happening in the local area, just with the people you're already connected with. So map who's in your church already and who do they know around. And then the next one is, how can you get involved? And this might be for someone who's starting out at the very, very beginning, or it might be for someone who's already doing quite a lot of stuff and wants to move more into the formalized support of family hubs or family support in some way. But I think these points might just help wherever you're at in that. Get to know the key players. Don't wait for an invitation. Nobody's going to come to you. Get to know people. Find out who's already, if it's a family hub you're interested in, find out what's happening locally. Are there family hubs? Are there children's centres? What's going on in your locality? And I think many people have said before, listen. Understand what's going on and listen to what people are saying. Read about the issues locally in your newspapers, on the online forums. I'm part of this um, horrific um, community Facebook which is the most horrific traumatizing thing every day because it's so negative and it's really insightful to hear what people are complaining about be part of the solution i think people have said that before it's so so important to be part of the solution if we just come up with more problems it's exhausting for the local authorities have a think about what the issues are and think what you could do about them and i think as someone else said and many people have said connect and partnership. Many churches think, well, we can do it ourselves. And actually we can't, none of us can do it ourselves and the local authorities certainly can't do it themselves. We need partnership. So connect in with your local CVS, the Faith Forum, go to councillors meetings, residence group, be open to partnership. And just, and my final bit, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions that come up in the chat of the many speakers who've done some incredible things today. And I think a number of the speakers have already said this as well. Understand your local authority. I think when Steve was talking, he was saying, like, take a look at the early help strategy. On the local authority's website, there will be their strategic visions. There'll be their strategies and their policies and their next steps have a think about what you can offer into those things that are their pain talk with your local councillors and be ready to kind of brainstorm with them what could be done about it one of the things at the moment there's refugees from afghanistan already in this country and probably going to be coming to your local area ask who they're going to be what is the plan what is the thinking is there a bridging hotel in your local authority the pressure for local authorities on this is massive but who better than the church to wrap around refugees to get alongside people with bespoke offers of support to integrate them into our community so that's a huge opportunity others talked about the post-covid opportunities you know there are people around who are so isolated and disconnected, not necessarily in huge need and known to services just now. We met 400 people just in our locality who were totally isolated, but didn't have any services at all. Now we're supporting those people, getting to know them, befriending them, making calls, taking them places. And the local authority have said, could you develop with us a social isolation policy and a strategy for how we do this with the other thousands of people that we met? Sorry, my phone's ringing, I'm just talking about. 
And finally, I just want to say, as you get involved in things, be ready to talk about what you're doing. Make sure you keep it known. Find out where there are different committees and different groups that you can get involved in. Right across the local authority, they are looking for engagement. Through the CBS, through the Faith Forum, they're looking for proactive people who are not going anywhere, who are going to help them find solutions. And there are a few hundred people just even have engaged in this webinar today who are actually ready to be part of that solution. So consider how you can help, be proactive in that process and bring what you have in your hand to do right now. Thank you. Avril, thank you so much for that. Um, that is that is lovely sort of ground up some very practical takeaway ideas there for people some very good starting points and for that and with all your experience there as well feeding into that it's been so helpful i'm sure for those listening now we have got time for i'm just looking at the big clock we've got time for some questions if we can't get through all of the questions um they will be well we've got some follow-up resources that will be available and we'll cover any that don't get answered now in that um, but we'll go to our panel and I've got some questions here and I will maybe suggest who'd like to first answer the question and then if anybody else from the panel wants to follow up with an answer then do feel free to do so. So thinking about just following on from a bit about this whole starting up um, family hubs there's a question here though and I guess actually Rachel perhaps I can start with you on this um, what should I do if my church doesn't want to have new programmes? Gosh, uh, I guess my question would be, are you the leader in that church and your church don't want to do it? Or are you the, the kind of the champion in your church who's desperate to do it and your leaders aren't interested? Um, because my, my response might be slightly different depending on who you, you know, kind of where you are in that. Um, I think um, listening to each other, I know I said I talked about listening to um, our, our community and our local authority, but actually as church, listening to each other, why, um, why is there reluctance, why is there reticence, is it because there's fatigue and exhaustion, um, and sometimes I think we need to be brave and start something, however small that is, and show what's possible, so I guess my answer would be different depending on where you are in terms of the um the church structure on that yeah. one yeah thank you Rachel that that makes sense anybody else want to just yeah. jump in on that one or we're not going to get into church politics yeah <laughs> <laughs> another question um concerning really the same thing about family hubs how many of you um and Ian the churches that you work with are using your own church buildings and how many of you have taken on new spaces? Who'd like to go first? So, uh, just if I jump in there, it's a mix, almost 50-50. Um, uh, uh, we've seen it, if, it really depends on the building. If you've got one big hall and it's, you know, wooden boards and it's not, you know, and it's a bit cold and so on, that's not going to be appropriate. Um, and there are a lot of local authorities who are looking at how, how to use their children's centres. And, you know, you've got a custom built centre there. And we're seeing that happen as well. Um, and it also depends on the locality of your church. You know, if you, you know, you might be in a, in a great place location-wise in a church, but the community you want to serve might be across the road. Uh, it's often best to go and find them. So we, we've seen a mix. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I was just thinking um, what Rachel um, was saying about, you know, the space we have often we have, if we have churches we have space which we use intensely on a Sunday but we've got all this space and I do think you know not every building obviously all of what Ian says is completely true but also it's like if you do have some space then that's a gift actually and you know otherwise it's just kind of sitting there um, and so let's if we're generous with space and we, if we, then, then we're helping and as soon as we're helping then we begin having conversations don't we and we're, we're more you know we're more we're trying to bless people really I mentioned something about space in the chat earlier um, which has been a really sort of valuable resource I think that we we're, we're sharing a lot more because of these relationships we've formed so um, during the pandemic um, one of the issues locally was 
families just being stuck at home in really overcrowded conditions sometimes, not able to take their children to school because schools weren't open. But so, so one of the partners just made their space, which previously was kind of a family space available to individual families. So they could just go and have a bit of, bit of time and, and to themselves in a, in a nice environment. Um, and then more generally, I think we've, outside of the pandemic, that, that sort of need for parents just to find ways to get together in particularly in communities where people are coming and going quite a bit, where people are quite mobile the sort of thing you get at the school gates when your children start school and you've got this kind of new community of parents that are in similar situations to yourself but if you can do that earlier with families just by making space available to them that i think that's a good way in um, and, and a resource that, that everyone's got in slightly different ways lovely thank you steve and, and actually steve while you're there a <laughs> um, couple of questions about working with local authorities i think which is a, which is a big thing for churches in particular they're new new to it and not really knowing where to start. So what are some good routes into conversations with local councils if you're struggling? Um, I think as I, as I mentioned earlier, the Supporting Families programme. So that's being sort of revamped a bit at the moment. Um, there's a question mark about what's gonna happen in the future with it, subject to the spending review. But um, but that, that's being sort of developed as kind of a whole system approach to providing help. Um, and every local authority is thinking about that and that, how they're going to take that forward. Um, each local authority has got someone like me who's got that role to coordinate it. Um, within reason, I might be able to tell people who, who to contact, certainly in London, um, for, for some, of, some of those programmes. The other thing I didn't say as well was that local safeguarding children's partnerships as well, who are really keen to kind of engage with faith communities um, and obviously churches are a good vehicle for doing that they they provide certainly provide training and they might have parts of their safeguarding plan which 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 are around that it's probably sort of slightly higher level than the kind of early intervention we're talking about but there, there will be people there who are wanting to develop that way of working um, and yeah covid recovery as i said before it's everyone's thinking what are we going to do now now things are starting to settle down a bit with particularly with families that we haven't worked with before who are suddenly in situations where they haven't needed support in the past but now they do it could be that your organizations are the, the ones that know these people and the ones that they trust and all local authorities are developing covid recovery strategies so we'd we'll be looking for partners around that okay thank you steve um, and the, there's another question, and it's the other side of the coin in a bit, although it still impacts for you, Steve, but perhaps um, with some of the others, with maybe Rachel or Ian or Avril, um, or Jenny even, how do, you, how do you move from being referred to from the statutory sector through to having contracts with the statutory sector? How do you do that big jump to being seen as a contract provider rather than just somebody to be referred to? Avril, you're nodding. Yeah, I mean, that, that can often be quite an interesting um, opportunity, really. I think, I think what we've done, and also what I say to others locally even today, is there is a place that when you find you're getting referrals and no one is paying for that, if you have funding for that, then wonderful. But there is a point at which you can say, do you know what, nobody's paying for this. So how do we start to have the conversation about who's going to pay for this? Because I do think it's actually quite an important thing. Now, there are times, to be honest, because it's just part of our mission that we do things anyway, but that's a decision. But it has to be a decision because otherwise there are other bits. That, so you, I would start to have a conversation with the people who are making the referrals, not saying, hey, you must pay me, but kind of saying, you know, we are finding this many people come through our doors. I think what Jenny was saying in as well, be careful, make sure you have evidence of the impact you are having on those families. And then have a grown up conversation with the people who are making referrals and saying, what are we going to do about this? And how might we fund it? And they may say, well, we've got no money, which I understand completely. But then you say, well, then can we look together at where this funding can come from? Because sometimes through a, a partnership with a local authority and a, and a, a charity or a church, you can actually go to a funder to prove the need that you already have. But it's a, it's a, it's, it's one of these conversations, a bit like Jenny said, you have to keep having and keep chipping away and be careful you don't just do things free because you think you should. There is, but it's fine to do things free as long as you know the value of it. Lovely, thank you, Avril. Well, can, I, can I jump in on that? Oh, Ian, okay? yes. And then maybe Rachel after you, Ian. 
Yeah. Cool. Um, so uh, the first thing I'd say is um, when you're providing a service for free, um, uh, it's your own house. You can do what you like. The rules are yours. The moment someone is paying for it, there is a big, big step up. That is a serious, we need to think hard about that moment. Um, but let's just say you want to do the step up. What will it mean? Um, it will mean you've got to be consistent. You've got to show outcomes. No one gives away money and hope it works out. They're going to want to know what happened with that money. How did you spend it? So we give, for example, if we get you know, a grant for 10 grand from a local authority, we'll get, um, you know, we'll have to count it for 50 pounds by 50 pounds by 50 pounds. And we'll also have to show the outcomes, where did they start, where did they finish. Um, and that is a big, you know, when, before you move that step, you know, that's, that's a big one to do. Let's just say you want to make, make that step where we look, well, um, everybody's going to laugh when I said this out loud, but actually early help and your local CCGs have more money than often they'll fess up to. An early help or have to run annual um, uh, grants um, uh, uh, funding bids. They're quite small, normally up to about five, maybe 10,000 pounds. But as everything Avril then said is absolutely bang on the money. You've got to show you evidence. You won't get any money unless you do. And you've got to be able to prove that you better deliver that service consistently because they depend on you. Um, CCGs uh, as well. How do you meet? How do you find out about this? Well, sometimes you have to go and find out who your local councillor is and they will know and they will tell you who that person is. But before you do that, you know, it's a, it's a deep breath moment because that is a big, that's a big transition. Mm, lovely, Ian, thank you. And Rachel, over to you, I think last comment now before we bring our webinar Sorry. to... Yeah, um, so firstly, I would say volunteering doesn't equal free. I think we need to acknowledge that, you know, that these things that, you know, there's, there's a cost... Um, whether a monetary cost or a time cost, but there is a cost. Um, and so, you know, don't forget the value of that. Um, partnership doesn't always need to mean money is the other thing. Um, we can be in partnership because we're connecting together and we're learning together. Um, and I think for us, the way that we, we first kind of like got into our journey, but ended up in our first service level agreement was because we were doing some voluntary work in a, a very loose kind of connection with somebody in the council who then put us in touch with somebody else who put us in touch with somebody else so you just never know where those connections might come from but when you're doing what you're good at and um and that's noticed and you're in those connections then you know anything can happen and you know god does crazy things lovely thank you thank you so much well, we are drawing to a close now, final minutes of our time together. First of all, a, a big thank you to everybody who's joined us online for this webinar. Um, if you've got any more questions, just send them through. So I'll, I'll put Catherine on the spot, send them through to the Family Hubs Network. Um, or you can contact us here at Care for the Family as well, if we can help you in any way at all. Uh, there will be more resources going out to you. Thank you, especially to all of our guest speakers today. Thank you so much for giving up your time giving us your wisdom, your enthusiasm, your energy, your insightfulness. That has been so helpful. And, and I've certainly learned a lot today. And also thank you to the Family Hubs Network because they've been banging on about this to government for quite a long time now. And it's lovely to see finally policy has actually woken up to the beauty that can be found within Family Hubs Network and working collaboratively with all agencies together. So thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day and do keep in touch with us. Goodbye. <laughs>